Now, for the benefit of those that were not in church last week, just a very quick recap of what the message was about last week. Pastor Adelaide actually started the teaching series on trust. And he expounded on the core principles of trust from a biblical perspective and how we can apply them to our lives. Now, he explained that for us to trust God with all our hearts and acknowledge him in all our ways. I think I got this here. It's very... Okay. Okay, all good now. Thank you. Thank you, media. Yeah, so Pastor Lee explained now, for us to trust God with all our hearts and acknowledge him in all our ways, we need to first ad- address that wrong idea or perception of ownership, security, and prayer. Ownership, security, and prayer. Now, like we all know, trust is not unidirectional, right? The reason we trust some people today is because they trust us in return, right? And like some other things in life, trust is usually likened to a two-way street. And I particularly like a quote credited to Zachary Larson, who is an American guitarist, which says, if you trust me, I will trust you. But if it only goes one way, then it is broken. Now, the same actually holds true for our relationship with God. Yes, God wants us to trust him. But guess what? He also wants to trust us in return. God wants to trust us in return. James 4, 8. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Meaning, trust God, and he will trust you. So, our message this morning is very simple. It's titled, A Believer as a Trustee. A Believer as a Trustee. Now, our society has actually in a way, ingrained in us a false idea of ownership. And that has no doubt, to a very large extent, contributed to some of the serious and trivial issues we experience in our world today. For example, countries have gone to war and still go to war over issues of ownership. I own this place. I've got, you know, I've got um, the right to this technology and that question of ownership. Siblings have become sworn enemies over title or asset ownership. Also, the question of ownership. And one you might even consider very funny is friends have actually gone into heated debates over who has the best your love. <laughs> and as, on another light, light note, basically, it actually reminds me of a very recent experience. Our little one, who is just less, less than two, started nursery some, some months back. And it would always come home every day with new words, like names, or fruits, or cars. And I found, I found it very entertaining until the day he came back home with a four-letter word, M-I-N-E, mine. And that week, almost everything he could touch became his, including those things that were bought before he was born. (laughs) Now, as funny as that may actually sound, it basically reflects the way we relate with God at times. Right? The way we actually claim ownership, we're actually guilty 
sometimes of claiming ownership in our relationship with God, just like that leads to child. A believer as a trustee. Now, very quickly, again, that raises again the question of ownership, like Pastor Adelaide mentioned last week. The word trust, trustee raises the question of ownership. So who is a trustee? A trustee in simple terms is a custodian or someone to whom something of, of value has been entrusted. Someone to whom something of value has been entrusted. Meaning, a trustee is not the real owner of the assets, but the trustee is saddled with the responsibility of pro protecting or managing that valuable asset in the best interest of the real owner. That's what a trustee is. So very quickly, let's just remind ourselves of the real owner of the things around us. Those we can see with our naked eye and those we can't see. And for us to remind ourselves, of course, we need to go back to the scriptures. Let's start with the heavens and the earth. Yes, we can't see the heavens, right? We just see cloud, but we can see the earth. Let's see what the Bible says about the heavens and the earth. Deuteronomy 10, 14. Deuteronomy 10, 14 says, To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Psalm 24, 1 also confirms the same thing. The earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. The world and all who live in it, meaning God owns us. So we've talked about the heavens and the earth. What does the Bible say about material resources, right? Food, money, and all that. Because the question is, okay, yeah, I get it. God owns the heaven and the earth, but does God own, own money? Does he own crop? Let's go back to the scripture and let's, let's, let's get to find out what the, the scripture says about it. Psalm 50, 10, to 13 says for every beast of the forest is mine the cattle on a thousand eels I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine if I were hungry I would not tell you for the world is mine and its fullness will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats. So God confirming that. So it's talked about all the things we see that, you know, we need to remain to sustain us, basically. And that's not actually covered money, but let's, let's, let's take a look at it. What, what does the Bible say about that? Agai 2, 7 to 8. Agai 2, 7 to 8 says, I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. Glory to God. Heavens belong to God, the earth, and we talk about material resources. Okay, okay, yeah, I get it. God owns all the material resources. But what about my skills? What about my natural abilities? What does the Bible say about that? Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he saw to your fathers, 
as it is this day. So those special abilities that we have are not as we were given by God. Again, I get that. Okay, God owns the heavens, the earth, material resources, natural abilities. But what about my body? Pastor Eli was saying something, you know, I can do anything with my body. What does the scripture say about that? What does it say about our bodies or our lives? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Now, this relates to us as Christians, because those that are not Christians cannot really relate to this. Okay. Of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own. Again, a reminder. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Honor God with your bodies. So it means that we, we, we need to take special care of our bodies, not because of ourselves, but because we are trustees of our body. Okay. So what is the bottom line here? The bottom line is that God owns everything, including us, and we own nothing. We own nothing. And that invariably answers the question about our roles as believers, right? We are simply trustees, managers, stewards, um, caretaker. There are several synonyms you could decide to use. By the end of the day, we are meant to act on God's behalf. We are meant to act on God's behalf. So the next logical question, therefore, is how can we show ourselves worthy of God's trust? How can we show ourselves worthy of God's trust? Mentioned earlier on, we all agree that trust is a two-way street. God wants us to trust him, but he also wants to trust us in return. Now, so how do we show ourselves worthy of God's trust? Basically by consciously living with that understanding that everything belongs to God and we are just appointed as managers of his resources. And it is at that point that ownership ends. With that mindset, ownership ends and stewardship begins. It starts with having that mindset. And Abraham is a very good example of someone that lived with that consciousness. From Genesis 17, when God started his relationship, not 17, actually God started um, from, say, um, Genesis 12, but we'll get to that later. But from 17, Abraham at that point in time was 99 years. And his name, as a matter of fact, then was Abram, which actually means exalted father. And then God called him and said, I want to make a covenant with you. I want to strike a deal with you if you can trust me and I can trust you in return. I will change your name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. Right? God promised him that at the age of 99. At that point in time, Abraham and Sarah had no child. Yet, God promised him he was going to make him father of multitude. You can imagine the level of trust Abraham have had. Abraham did not doubt that. You know, Abraham's encounter basically reminds me of something very related. Before Christ was born, of course, an angel appeared to Zechariah, who was also quite old with his wife then, and they had not had any child. And then the angel told him, 
Oh, you will have a child, he just laughed. Ha, 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 ha. How will that happen? Right? Because it is very easy for us to think that way these days because we try to work out the logic for God. But Abraham, our father, based on the fact that we are now connected in truth through Christ, never doubted God. In Genesis 20, 21, that actually came, came to pass. At the age of 100, Isaac was born. And then, yes, okay, it's looking more like it. But God still wanted to test Abraham. He wanted to be able to trust. He wanted to confirm whether Abraham was worthy of his, of his trust. When Isaac was in his prime, as it were, in his early 20s, God made an interesting request, something that would be very difficult for us these days to actually do. The same child that God gave him, God requested. As, a, as at that time, Abraham was probably about 125. And then God said, you know what? The son that I've given you, yeah, I already promised you that will make you father of a multitude. And now you feel, okay, that's going to come to pass. But I want you to now sacrifice this son to me in a place that I will show you. In fact, God had not revealed where he was meant to make that sacrifice. And then Abraham got two of his servants, got his son, and he embarked on a three-day journey. Three days. Three days. And then finally, he saw where God was leading him to. And it got to a point where he was going to actually proceed with that because his son actually asked him that, oh, dad, I can see. Yes, we're going to make a sacrifice to God. I can see the wood. I can see the knife. Where is the... <laughs> where? Yeah. And Abraham said, the God will provide himself. God will provide himself. Does this remind us of times when we try to overcalculate for God and when God is saying do this we're like no God it's like they're not looking at this account though. Um, God it's like you're not looking at my career path eh? you're not it may be you're not we try to overcalculate for God and I, I love the way Paul actually you know eventually summarized what uh, Abraham's kind of faith. Pastor Leah said, yeah, um, the, the, was it last week? And I love the way Pastor Leah um, phrased it. He said, trust is faith in action. Trust is faith in action. In Hebrews 11, 17 to 19, I, I feel Paul just summarizes Abraham's ex experience perfectly. He says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises of, offered up his only begotten son. And now what this reminds me of is, God will never ask us to do something he can't do himself. God eventually offered his only son to all of us. Glory to God. And by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Right? He didn't ask God that. God, wait till, are you sure you've not forgotten that promise? <laughs> right. Concluding, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also rece received him in the figurative sense. Hallelujah. Yeah. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. He treated God as the owner and he acted as a trustee. He played his role. And I think that is something we all need to do because at times we just basically start
overthinking for God. We we don't trust Him. Trust is is not partial, right? And that's what God tried to tried to, to, to test. Now, I believe the next logical question here is we need to earn God's trust. Abraham actually earned it. And we'll find out later that because he earned it, God referred to Abraham as a friend. And if you look at the Old Testament, no one else actually got that close. No no one else was able to establish that level of intimacy. So what qualities ensure that God can continue to trust us and commit even more into our hands? What qualities ensure that God can continue to trust us and con- commit even more into our, our hands? I'll, I'll share three with us today. The first, I believe, is commitment. Commitment. Unwavering loyalty. That without doubt, without questioning, Abraham did not doubt God. He didn't question God. Right? And about commitment, I feel there are times when you know, God actually gave, uh, which is the same, same command is given to us, that we should not have any, we should not place any other God above him. In Deuteronomy 6, 5, 5 it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Undiluted trust. But what tends to happen at times is we sometimes put our trust in something else or someone else subconsciously. Subconsciously. Sometimes we get to a level where we think we no longer need God. And we see God as our backup plan. God says he wants to be our only plan. I I can remember a number of times that God has actually given me a slap on on the wrist for acting in in a way like that, you know, acting in a way where I'm esteeming something above God. You know, it just so happens, you feel, oh, God, I think I've got this. You know, it's something you've been doing for a while. Before you started, you would pray, 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 pray. But now it's something you've been doing for years and you're like, okay, God, don't worry. I got this. I got this. Driving test, oh, God, please help me. I am, I'm so nervous about this. And then five years, you've now become more like um, a Formula One racer, right? And you're like, God, don't worry, right? What are we doing there, basically? We are placing our trust. Sometimes we're actually that God we are worshipping. One experience I remember was some years back when I got a job as a permanent staff with, with a company. And always a big thing to get a job as a permanent staff. It's like a sense, again back to Pastor Adelaide's um, preaching last week, false sense of security, right, compared to contract role. And then to actually add more like ice into that, I was fortunate to work with very senior management staff. I was working with an executive director and almost on a weekly basis, I would attend board meetings. You know, I felt it was nice. And it was around about the time, of course, the global, global recession, almost every com- com- well, say any company that didn't, that didn't get it. Of course, my company got it. And that was when they came up with that buzzword right sizing instead of downsizing, right? Right, right. Uh, we are just right sizing, packaging, <laughs> packaging it, you know. Now, I had the word that was going to be right, right sizing. And at that point, because I was working very close to senior management staff, I just thought to myself that, okay, the company has got about 10,000 staff before they even get to me. 
considering the fact that I'm mingling with the weasel, before the, before the <laughs> you know, and then I went on vacation. Interestingly, we we're meant to to start up a new department. I was involved in in basically drafting the old things. I was I was feeling myself. But God actually gave me a slap on the wrist. That I, you are missing the point. You are missing the point. You didn't get this job because you were actually even the best in the first place. Right? You didn't. I gave this to you and I, you know, added other things. Right? At this point in time, it should not be a case of, I had done the maths, basically. I had done the maths. Oh, okay, I know I'm um, very close to the ED. Oh, everything is all sorted and all that. Long story short, I was one of the set, first set of people <laughs> that got fired. Yeah. And I had to go back to God and say, I'm sorry, God. That was me, basically trying to play God. I wanted to take the place of God. Now, there is nothing wrong in using your connections. There is nothing. There is nothing wrong. God actually put people in our lives to really help us. But when we begin to put our trust in those people, that's where we, we miss it. Our trust should be in God and we should return the glory to him. Another good example there is the rich fool. The rich fool. God is not against being rich. We all know that. He's not against it. That's why this is, re is being referred to as a rich fool. And it was the same thing that happened to the rich fool. Right? So let's just read that very quickly. Let's re read the, the, the account. Luke 12, 16 to 20. It says, um, yeah. Okay, and he, told, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, hmm, this is what I will do. I will tear down the bands and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. I'll just pause there. Are we, are we going to that level where we, we feel we've gotten to the peak of our career and we're like, I've gotten there. That was what happened to the rich fool. He said to himself, he made himself God competing with God. And then, okay, thank you. But get, God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Again, a reminder that God owns everything, including our life. There's a recession now, and the question is, do, you, do we actually feel relaxed because we feel, okay, I've got a job, I've got a job, right? Yes, the job is there, but God wants us to always remember he is our provider, he's our source, he's our sufficiency. It's not about what we have around. He has blessed us with those things, and we should not put our trust in those things. We should always go back to him. Commitment. Now, Commitment, basically, strengthens the bond of friendship, right? Because you are very close to, to some people today because they are committed to that relationship, because of their commitment. They check up on you and all that. And the thing is, apart from God being our Lord, he also wants to befriend us. He wants to be our friend. And that's why what makes the almighty God different from all other gods. Because all other gods see their worshiper as subjects. God loves us. He is our Lord. 
He is our God, but he also wants to be our friend. friend. And like I mentioned earlier on, only in the Old Testament, only Abraham achieved that level of, of in intimacy. Right? And he was able to achieve that because God saw that he was worthy of his trust. From Genesis 12, 1 to 4, I want to read very, very, very quickly. You know, when God gave Adam, sorry, Ab uh, Abraham, that instruction, it was, it's something we'll describe as asking someone to leave certainty, you know, certainty for uncertainty. Just a quick read, uh, Genesis 12, 1 to 4. At that time, Abraham was 75. And he was still Abraham then. It was, it was um, when he was 99 that God made that covenant with him and changed his, his, his name to, to um, Abraham. Okay, so um, now the Lord, uh, the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. From your family. It's like God saying, get out of your comfort zone. Right? Okay. And the problem is there. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will cause him who causes you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him, and Abraham, okay, my son has gone off the screen. Okay, so basically, Lot, Lot went, went, went with him, okay, and Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Aaron, or Aaron to Canaan. So the question is, is God asking us, or is God asking you to do something now? And are you trying to overcalculate? Second Chronicles 27 basically confirms the, the, the kind of relationship that existed between Abraham and God. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabit inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? and give it for forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. And Isaiah 41.8 also buttresses the same fact. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, But good news, brethren. Good news. No one is smiling. <laughs> good news, right? Christ has actually established the same relationship on our behalf. Glory to God. John 15, 15. John 15, 15. No longer do I call you servant, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things I heard from my father, I have made known to you. So we are friends, God. Glory to God. So that's the first quality. First quality, commitment. Commitment. The second quality, talking about what qualities ensure that God can continue to trust us and commit more into our hands. Second is contentment. Contentment. Now, contentment means to be at ease on the inside, regardless of circumstances on the outside. It has to do with an inner trust and dependence upon God as we rest peacefully and thankfully in our present circumstances. Basically means to be okay where I am until I get where I want to go. 
being okay where I am until I get where I want to go. Now, it is being content is different from being being complacent, or it, it's it's not about about um, being in mediocre. No, that's that's not the case, because as a matter of fact, God even wants us to achieve great things. And that's what He's put. He's created us in His own image, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's not it's not about oh, okay, just settling for, you know, it's not about giving up on the desires to go like uh, go for that in life. That's not what what what's, what what it's about. Again, it's just about you know being okay where you are until you get where you because it's. We are all on a journey. And lack of co contentment, I would say, has contributed, in my opinion, to a large extent to the commotion in the church today. Right? And that's resulted from, you know, um, lack of co contentment is manifested primarily in two ways. Envy, competition. Envy, competition, a lot of competition in the church. Now there's a lot of noise about diversity today, and it's now like the latest thing in town, right? But guess what? God initiated that. It was God's idea right from the beginning. Diversity. When he created, when he started creation, he didn't create all, or he didn't make all creatures the same. In fact, Male and female, he created them. And for languages, God has also given us different gifts for a reason. God has given us different gifts for a reason. Someone would always be more talented than another. That is what we should understand. And it shouldn't be a case. And God has a reason for that because at the end of the day, what has been entrusted to us is not just for us. It is for us to serve others. And we're just meant to focus on what God has given us and not envy others. Because that's what the world does. Competition. So we have in Matthew 25, 15, just to portray the fact, because when Jesus, of course, when, whenever he shares parables, he usually describes the mind of God, right? Matthew 25, 15 says, talking about um, a master, you know, it says, and to one, he gave five talents, to another, two, and to another, one, and to each, according to his own ability, to each, according to his own ability. The reason you are more talented than somebody else is because God knows your ability. And the reason someone else is more talented than me is because someone, the God, knows my ability. And I should be content with God, what God has given me because that is the, the, the mandate. God will not judge me. He won't judge us based on what is given someone else. It won't judge us based on that. It will be based on what is given us. And I think that causes us a lot of stress, right? Because we just want to, we see someone, oh, this person is so good at this. I want to become. If God wants it, God will bless you with it. But still stay in your lane. Contentment. Contentment. It's very important. Again, to buttress that Ephesians 4, 7, 7 says, but to each one of us, Grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Now, God is a just God, right? He's not partial, is he? He isn't. So if he decided to give me one talent and someone else two, he knows best. After all, they all belong to him. So why should I... You know, it's like you're giving someone something and they're like, oh, okay, you're sharing, say, um, a, it's a charity and you decide to give some a particular number. You can imagine how you would feel if someone walked up to you, oh, can you, you give so-so person like um, 10 packs and you gave me five. Why? 
how would we feel? And I think that basically what, what, what God is trying to draw attention to. We need to stay focused on the assignment that God has given us. God will not give us an assignment outside the resources or gift he's given us. He would not. If he needs us to take up an assignment, he would bless us with the resources needed. And I also think that that's what God tried teaching the Israelites. Contentment. When they were in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 years, guess what? God told them he was going to give them manna on a daily basis. Now, the same God could have said, okay, you know what? Just get a store. I'll give you a supply for as long as you will be in, that, in this wilderness. Still, God wanted to teach them contentment, which they still didn't get at the end of the day. And it's very difficult for us to get that as humans because we need the help of the Holy Spirit to get that, to get there. We need the Holy Spirit. And even Paul confirmed that in Philippians 4, 11, 12. Philippians 4, 11, 12 says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it means to be in need, and I know what it, what it means to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul had to learn it, and it's something we also need to learn. May God help us in Jesus' name. Amen. And I like the way um, um, Timothy, Timothy rather, I'll actually put it in, in first. Timothy 6.6 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness, contentment is great, great gain. Now, commitment can be likened. The first point, commitment can be likened to godliness because if you look at it critically, it's about just not placing anyone else, including ourselves or anything else, above God. So those two are great gain. And finally, third, quality I'd like to share is fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. Now the mindset of a good trustee is that of an investor and not a waster. The mindset of a good, good trustee is that of an investor and not, not a waster. And uh, Pastor Henry actually shared some, some week, weeks back you know, where, where, where he talked about you know, uh, the bread, bread and the seed. Right. So when God blesses us, the resources he blessed, he blessed us with, basically, he wants us to use some of them for ourselves. But he doesn't want us to use everything because there's always a seed there. He's blessed us with some of those things so that we can help others the same way we will benefit from the gifts he's given to, to others. Right? So, for instance, if you're very skilled in a particular area and you've not actually you know, helped anyone in terms of maybe coaching, supporting, or pointing them in, in, in the right di that direction, then you, you are actually a waster because you're just taking everything off, you're growing fat, and you're not giving out. Now, one way to be fruitful is by serving others. I serve one another. First Peter 4.10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve. Use whatever gift you have received to serve. So as, as trustees, we have the responsibility to use what, would I, what we have been given wisely, just like the parable of the talent. Again, parable of talent. One was given five, one was given two, and one was given one. Now, the one that was given one was not content, basically. I guess it was probably, but assuming it was, oh, okay, master gave someone five. And two, I'll just go bury mine. While others, the other two, went and made profit. They served their gifts. So the point there is basically, we, it's actually up to us. We can choose to bury our gifts, like the lazy trustee, or make more from what we have been given, like the good trustees. May God help us to be like the good trustees in Jesus' name. Now, the great thing also is that as we prove ourselves faithful in small things, 
we will be giving more and bigger things to the stewards over. That was what happened to the, the two the stewards. Uh, they were not judged based on the amount of gifts because at the end of the day, they both received the same reward. It was more about the faithfulness. And God will entrust us with even more in order to further his kingdom. And God basically, with God, it's a case of either you get a reward or you get cut off if you're not performing. God doesn't like those that do not bear fruit. John 15, 1 to 2, Christ describing that perfectly, says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So it's three qualities we need to bear in mind. Commitment, contentment, and fruitfulness. So in conclusion, we, we need to reflect on what we have done or what we are doing with resources committed into our care and make necessary changes uh, because, of course, we would all give account before the judgment throne as individuals and not, not as a church. We need to bear in mind that the master's judgment won't be based on how much we have been given. I think that's very important. It won't be based on how much we have been given, but how faithful we have been. Again, the case of the first two stewards, five and two, they got the same reward, but they were given different gifts, which is why we should not try to be like others that have been given capacity. So you have someone that is able to juggle 20 things at a time or 50 things, and you're trying to be like the same person. When you've not been given the gifts, you will just stress out, right? So it's good to note, stewardship begins and ownership ends when we are mindful that everything belongs to God and is appointed us to manage his resources. Stewardship begins and ownership ends when we are mindful that everything belongs to God and is appointed us to manage his resources. Let us pray. As individuals, I, I want us to reflect on two <coughs> questions very quickly. Point, ask yourself, and it's a question I'm asking myself now, what choices am I making that are not in line with the Lord's priorities? What choices am I making that are not in line with the Lord's priorities? Because I probably see myself as the owner, I'm not taking my place as, as a trustee. And the second is, how do my actions reflect a life that is self-centered, and not God-centered? How do my actions reflect a life that is self-centered and not God-centered? While we're reflecting on that, I would like to give anyone in this auditorium or probably just join us online that has not, those that have not given their lives to, to, to Christ, Again, Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the whole world and all who live in it. You need to go back to your source. And if you'd like to do that this morning, just say this very simple but powerful prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner and I ask you to forgive me. 
I believe your son, Christ Jesus, died and rose to live again that I might be forgiven. I now receive and confess him as Lord and Savior. If you just said that prayer, I'd like to congratulate you. And as a church, we would like to support you on this journey because we're actually also supporting ourselves, right? We need one another. So if you're worshiping in person, feel free to reach out to, to one of the ushers and uh, to give more information on how we can support. If you're worshiping online, please just send a note, email. You can send a note right now in the chat box or send an email to admin at cianorthampton.org and someone will reach out to you. Church, let's ask for forgiveness for misplaced priorities. Let's ask God to, for, to forgive us in a way we might be, have been self-centered and instead of being God-centered. Yeah, we, we can't change yesterday. Yeah, yes, yesterday is basically gone. We can't change it. We may have squandered what God gave, gave, gave us, right? But we can do a lot about today, about tomorrow. Let's, let's ask for that grace. Let's, let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Let's pray the Holy Spirit would help us invite those qualities that we would always be reminded of that fact that we own nothing. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit would really help us to invite those qualities. Commitment. Contentment. That the Holy Spirit would help us to be fruitful. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding us of our roles as trustees. Help us to constantly live with that mindset. We receive the grace to trust God and to be faithful trustees like our father, Abraham, we tap into that grace. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Almighty Father. We glorify you. We praise your holy name. Glory to you, Father. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Glory to God. Praise the Lord, church. Praise God.